Anyway, welcome everybody. What's happening? Okay. Art is our president, by the way. <laughs> don't know. Yes. Well, thank you for putting this slide together, uh, Ellen. But yes, our our meeting in November is going to actually be a plant sale and book sale on a Sunday. Um, so as it says there, Sunday, November 14th from 11 to 3 at our, our former normal meeting place, the San Francisco County Fair building at 9th and Lincoln uh, at Striving Arboretum. Uh, we've, we had been given a, a significant grant last December to hire somebody to grow a lot of plants for us, for our meetings. Um, the person's been growing us lots of plants, but as you all know, we have not had a single meeting. Uh, so they've just been building up. So we have a whole bunch of plants and um, a lot of them are unusual things. I know that a bunch of Luculias uh, have been grown, different clones of them, um, as well as a lot of other unusual and, and wonderful plants. So do plan on coming to this uh, special uh, book sale and plant sale. The other, uh, the books are the other half of Ted Kipping's library that, uh, that was given to us to sell. Um, and we had the one book sale of the first half uh, in February of 2020, uh, for those of you who were there. Um, this will be the other half. And since I've been storing the vast majority of these for the last year and well, more than a year and a half, uh, we want them all gone, uh, so they're going to be priced very, very, very inexpensively uh, so that they all go away. Um, as it says there, masks will be re required, uh, cash and checks preferred. We will also have PayPal, uh, but no credit cards. And we're also looking to, for help with this uh, to set up and sell and uh, clean up at the end of the sale. And that anyone that does uh, will be given 12 uh, free plant drawing tickets to be used at a future in-person meeting. There is no November Zoom meeting because we are doing the plant sale instead. So we are going to do a December meeting, but we're doing it early and it'll be another end of the year party like we did a year ago. Uh, so please feel free to come to that and, uh, and enjoy uh, the festivities in December. So I think that's about it, unless Ellen, is there anything I forgot to mention? Oh. There will be, in addition to the plants that we're uh, actually having grown for us, um, I have propagated a number of plants from Ted Kipping's garden. Uh, and again, now I've had them for about two years uh, or it's getting close to two years. Um, and uh, several of our other board members have also been growing uh, small amounts of, of interesting plants uh, that everyone should be interested in. So uh, there should be a lot of very interesting things. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all in person, but masked. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Bart. Well, welcome again to the uh, September California Horticultural Society meeting. And tonight we have Cristobal El Guetta, and gardens of coastal Chile, which I'm very much looking forward to. And we'll do, um, so Cristobal is based near Santiago, Chile, and has been passionate about plants all his life. When we practiced uh, in May, he said that uh, if you took plants out of his life, there would be about 15% left. <laughs> 
anyway, so first of all, as a trained forest engineer, but I understand I never professionally worked in that capacity, but as I've been designing gardens starting at the age of six, but professionally since the year 2000. Since a young age, she has um, been studying the stress tolerant natural plant communities and observed their tendencies to not be invasive, take a small space and their seasonality and uses this knowledge of a plant, plant's natural characteristics in the garden design process. I'm looking forward to learning some uh, new insight tonight and um, that I can maybe use in my own garden. So without further ado, welcome Cristobal. Hello, good night. How are you doing? Good, good. A little bit nervous. This is my second time talking in English. So, uh, well, obviously Spanish is my first language, but I'll try to, to do my best. Relax, so if I'm okay. using a strange word, please let me know. You're my friends, just relax. Thank you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the journey. Um, my name is Cristóbal Guetta. As Ellen said, I'm a forestry engineer and I'm a self-taught landscaper. So forestry engineer is my career, but plants have been my passion since I was a kid. And plants have been in my family for almost four uh, generations. And I work with Magdalena Calvo. Uh, she's an artist, but she's also a landscape designer and uh, we work together. So I started making gardens professionally in the year 2000. And when I started making my gardens, like many uh, self taught lands landscapers, I use a plant, uh, I make design, but the most important for me was to choose the correct plants, to use the plants that were perf perfectly adapted to the place. And I was passionate about, about nature. And that seems to be enough to be passionate, to like color and to know which plants uh, will trip where I have to build the garden. And because I live in central Chile and most of the people in Chile will live in the arid and Mediterranean area of Chile, most of my work start, started or was done in semi-arid places uh, near the coast or in the central valley. So obviously I very soon understood that the water wise approach was fundamental and which was not that obvious at this time in, in Chile. Um, because we have huge mountains, a lot of glaciers, we used to have a lot of water when I started gardening, but now we've been in a drought for 15 years. And this year has been, like in California, a terrible year, very dry. So, and when you start working in the Chilean uh, coast, you have two different soil conditions. So you have in uh, gra granite, disintegrated granite and sandy soils. And these soils have a very low fertility. Uh, what at the beginning, I thought it was bad, but now I can realize that it's perfect for what I want to do. So, um, because I used to make a lot of trekking when I was a kid uh, and I was a, a teenager and I love plants, I was very familiar with the plants communities. And I understood that uh, different soils and different conditions means different plants. So it makes a huge difference when you work in sand than, for example, when you work with granite, because there are different soils and you have different plants adapted to this soil. Okay. And it may sound obvious, but when I started working, that was a big difference with my colleagues, because most of the time, uh, the Chilean landscapers, uh, we used to have, or we used to work, we try to work the site uh, in a way to use the plants we like, but we don't understand the site to use the plants that really will grow in this area. So this is very obvious now, but 30 years ago, it was not, it was not that, that much, okay? And because the Chilean system is a very, very colorful and dramatic one, um, I've been very, uh, I've been touched very much by the Chilean nature and the color, how it changed drama, drama, dra, dramatic, dramatically. Changes happens very fast. So everything is brown, you have the rain, and in three or six weeks, you can see a lot of 
plants blooming, growing, everything changes so fast in the Mediterranean. But at this time, when I started landscaping, most of the plants were exotic. But in a certain way, my inspiration uh, was the coastal semi-arid natural plant communities of central Chile. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been to Atacama, but every four, five, six years, we have the desert blooming. So we have a very dynamic, dynamic color and also what I call a texture landscape. And when you see that, you cannot be not inspired. It's absolutely amazing. And when you've been exposed to such beauty and perfection, it's impossible for a landscaper not to try to see how in a certain way learn from nature to try to make your gardens more like nature. And I'm not saying that you have to copy the nature, but is this like germ of wild, wilderness, which is in a certain way, the, the basis of every of the project we undertake with Macarena. To learn color, Alstromedia. And you'll see in my work, a lot of Alstromedias. Uh, we have like almost a hundred kind of different Alstromedias in Chile. And this is my uh, color combination teacher. I love Alstromedias. They grow almost everywhere in Chile from very dry areas, high in the mountains, in the south of Chile, also in the cold Patagonia. So uh, Alstromedia has been, uh, have been my combination teacher, but they also taught me a lot of uh, about um, plant architecture. And I'll talk this a little bit later, okay? So uh, you see that Alstromedia is what I call my uh, muse. Uh, and I've been in contact with Alstromedia since I was a child. And I love not just the color and the architecture of the Alstromedias. And here you have an Alstromedia Magnifica. But when you start looking at them with more attention, you see that there's a lot of different relationship with a lot of different insects and some of them very specialists that you would that you won't see in other plants so there you have in the garden i show you first lots of altromedias but when you start landscaping um, and you had contact with nature it happens sometimes not always but it can happen that, that you start to become aware of all the parameters on how nature works. So probably uh, you you will you you won't be able of knowing everything, but you start to understand how the plants how can how can I say that how the plants interact with with each other, and you start to understand that you have what is called a plant community, and then. I understood that the most diverse plant community of my country is not the cold Patagonia or the cold jungle, but it is a semi-arid system near Los Molles in uh, northern uh, Chile, or central north Chile. And what you realize is that in this system, which is very, very dry, you have a lot of things that happen. But the first thing is that it's a system that is always covered with plants. Some of the plants will uh, disappear in summer. Some of them will have like a dormancy, very, very um, interesting with changes of color. But you start to understand that you have to think the plant, not just a plant, but you have to understand the plant as a whole, as a community. And every plant has a very special characteristic, which is not just the color or maybe the shape, but they have cycle, they have architecture, and they uh, can attract a lot of different insects, etc. So I start to understand that you have to think the plant as a community and you have to start to pay more attention to uh, more sophisticated things, maybe like cycle, architecture. And you, I start to, to understand that when you made the garden, you have to try to think in an ecological term. These are Puya Venusta. I remember that some of you came to Chile in 2019. Uh, it was a very dry year also. So a lot of these plants were not blooming when you came. But when you start uh, looking or paying more attention to nature, you start, you, st you start to see that there's a lot of community, there's a lot of plants that associate with just one kind of plant. So associations in nature are not random. So plants uh, live together with 
some rules and that's what I tried now to apply in my garden design. So this is nature and I don't see this picture just finding the picture nice or beautiful or with nice color or nice architecture, but I start to understand how plants associate, okay? And when you understand these ecological principles, uh, you can apply them the same, the same um, ecological principles in your garden, which is not to copy nature, but to understand which are the principles that uh, makes the, the nature works, okay? And I'll try to apply this in a design of a garden. And then I have two sentences that for me are very important. And the first one is, tell me, where are you from? I'm talking about the plants. And I will tell you which are the conditions uh, to which you had adapt. So I know if you're talking to me about, from a plant coming from California, probably you will have like a very dry summer, a wet winter. Um, it depends obviously on this part of the valley, but tell me where are you from? And I will tell you which are your adaptations. And the other things that I learned is you have to try to understand then how the plant is, and I'm talking about architecture, not just the way it grows, but also shade tolerance, uh, how fast they grow, if they, hide, if, they have, if they have dormancy, et cetera. And if I know that, I know which will, will be the association to other plants, to form a plant community, okay? So I'll show you another garden, which is a Jardín Campino in central Chile. And I always use this picture because this is one of the last remain of the um, coastal cliff. Uh, everyone wants to have a house near the coast, so the uh, coastal cliff has been wiped. We, there's still some very small spot. This is one of it, and it, it has been a very um, inspirational. It's been a school for me about plants communities. So what happened in the coast of Chile? And it has to be probably the same in California. So that we transformed, which used to be a very rich a hotspot, uh, absolutely amazing, in a very poor system with a lot of bare soil, with a lot of exposed soil. And uh, these gardens are a little or very small contribution. In, I'm talking about environmental contribu uh, contribution. And what you will see in our gardens in the coast that we have a lot of South Africa, a lot of Australia, a lot of California, but very little about Chile because we don't know how to use, we don't know our native plants, but we love the Australian, the South African uh, or uh, California from the Mediterranean. And this is a big problem because we're a very strange system where there's a lot of, um, well, a lot of animals that are very specialist. So you take out what one plants and there's a lot of species that depend on the plants and they, they will just disappear, okay? So this is very fashionable plants, a lot of proteas, as I told you, South African, but in Australian, but look, a lot of bare soil, and you will never see that in the coastal system, well preserved. So this is a garden, a very simple design because we wanted to plant as much as possible. The owner of the house was absolutely, absolutely crazy for plants. Uh, she wanted a lot of uh, exotic plants, but uh, we convinced her to use a lot of native uh, because we knew how, how to use them. And what we wanted was uh, nature immersion. We wanted our customers living in a, a Mediterranean system. So we used a lot of plants. Uh, we were not allowed to use trees, which was not a problem because in our system, the trees usually uh, don't grow very near the ocean because it's very windy uh, and the soils, they have very low fertility. So you'll find the trees a little bit further and we were not allowed to trees because of the sightseeing, okay? So what we made was to uh, build a plant community from very low fertility soil with a lot of native. And I talk about low fertility um, because this is very important for our coastal system. A lot of our native plants do grow in very low fertility soils. And when you start adding fertilizer or compost or watering too much, they simply die. They need dry drought, they need, they need drainage, and they need low fertility soil. But the problem, problem with that is if you use just native plants, a lot of our native plants are very interesting during the spring, early summer, maybe winter, 
but they're not very interesting for our, for our customers during the summer because they go dormant. So your garden will be brown and most of our customers are using their houses during the summer. So we started to understand that we have to use um, exotic plants and native plants at the same time, okay? So there you have another side scene with Eringium paniculatum. This is Solanum maritimum and Chistante grandiflora, which are uh, very common. So what we did is that applying the principles that govern natural plant ecosystem, what we make is take, we take plants from different areas and we build new plant communities. And because in their um, ecological origin, they work in the same way, we can make new plant communities that do not exist in nature, but start to exist in our gardens with native and exotic plants. And that's very interesting because you make your garden more uh, resilient, biodiverse, and you have very beautiful plant communities, especially in the summer where a lot of our native plants go dormant. And one of the very important key is a plant architecture. So to see how the plants grow, because you can have what is called Being a multi-layer garden. Uh, you have a lot of different plants growing in the same place. Uh, some of them will be warm season growing plants. Some, of, some others will be cool season grass. So you have the soil always covered and you have a lot of pollen, nectar, uh, you'll have seeds. And so you're providing food to all the uh, wild animals animals that will come to your uh, garden, especially in this garden, to the, to the giant hummingbird. We don't provide just the food, but we also provide uh, the nesting area. Uh, the Ringium paniculatum is one of the plants that the giant hummingbird used to use to make the nest. So a lot of unpredicted things start to happen when you start uh, using these native and exotic plants. And that's why it's so important to, uh, to be all the time monitoring your garden for years, to know what happened, not just with the plants, but with all the ecosystem, okay? Here you have uh, in the Campinos garden, the giant hummingbird uh, nesting, breeding, and the plant selection make the difference. So if you go to the uh, neighbor's garden, you'll see just flowers, but no uh, wildlife. And if you come to this garden, you're gonna see a lot of uh, diversity, nice plants and everything growing and working. Right so now it's is not just a beautiful green uh, and colorful biological desert. It's a full of life, amazing garden ecosystem. And that's what we make now with my uh, partner, Magarena. So when you realize that, you understand that the garden has a huge potential preserving the environment. So we have the power, we landscapers and gardeners, to really save a lot of plants, a lot of insects. So uh, this, this is what we're doing now. We're, lot, we're, we're doing a lot of ecology um, using uh, these native and exotic plants. Look, the Campinos Garden was our very a uh, first design with using this approach of plant communities because we usually use just nice plants that works in the in the site. But after years working with native plants, we understood that if you want to work with Chilean native plants, one thing that is very important is that you have to to try to plant them as small as possible. And what we also learn is that you have to try to understand how the plants grow in nature so that you can establish this plant in a certain, a similar way. And that especially happen, happen with some of the plants that we'll show you next, um, which are absolutely endangered of extinction. And uh, it has been very hard to understand that a lot of these plants needs really very special conditions to grow. And we plant, a lot of them, so uh, we're helping this plant not to di disappear, uh, not to be extinct. And in this garden, uh, I'll show first the design process, which is very strange because you'll see that at the very beginning, there's not design, not hard, hardscape, just plant communities. And this is because we're making a mixture between restoration and landscaping in this garden. Um, it, it's a coastal cliff, so very hard to restore it. Uh, and we use what we call the matrix system. So what we make is we made like, uh, we use different kinds of plants and we make 
um, how can I say that um, prefabricado, um, like pre-built matrix uh, with different kind of plants. So we're gonna use a lot of stress tolerant plant, for example, in shrubs, we're gonna use some other matrix with uh, herbaceous plant. We'll use some other matrix with exotic plants. So we're gonna make kind of puzzle, if I can talk that, uh, with different stratas of plants. Lot, all of them are um, drought resistant. And we're gonna make a matrix system with warm season and cool season growing in plants uh, because we want uh, flowers and colors the whole year. We want to use other native plants, but at the same time, we want the exotic plants because it's when uh, they bloom when most of the customers will use the house. And uh, in this garden, we're, we're not gonna use many grasses. We're just gonna use some very intolerant grass and I'll show you why a pioneer grass because we, we have to try to uh, keep as much soil as possible. So this is what we call a multi-cycle system. So you see a different plant combination, usually in a matrix. And you see that uh, all these plants have a different cycle. They grow in different season and bloom in different season. And usually when you have a native plants that go absolutely dormant and doesn't have a nice summer, we're gonna use an exotic plant uh, that this warm season grower growing, not invasive, but very showy, very interesting to cover like the hole that the dormant plants will live in the garden. In this garden, we're starting using what we call the Norse plant structure for establishment, which is to use a plant that grows very fast, but will die very early. In this case, Budleya Davidi, with a Chilean native plant, which is on the verge of extinction, which is Mitsante cogimbensis, because we understood that uh, some of our plants need this covering plant, this nurse, nurse plant, to protect it from the wind and from the sun and to restore the soil. And then the native plant will start grow, grow, and finally the exotic plant will die or even the native plants that we use as nurse will die. And we will uh, successfully establish this Mirciante cogimbensis. And here is the uh, um, Fuxelisoides when we started, uh, when I don't remember the name of one of you, but we were talking about Fuxelisoides. What we're also doing here is that a um, lot of our native plants, uh, especially like Fuxelisioide or some of our Oxalis, are uh, absolutely ecological key plants. So they are very important for hummingbirds or for insects and a lot of very specific and um, specific insects. But for example, the Fuxelisioide, which is a very nice Chilean native plant, has a wonderful winter, wonderful spring, wonderful fall, but very bad summer. So we, we're going to use a warm season plant like Budleya which in our system is not an invasive, to cover this Chilean plant that doesn't look very nice during the summer. And then we cut back the Budleya Davidi in early fall, and then the Fuxelisioide appear and will bloom the whole winter. We're going to use also a lot of uh, stress tolerant plants, bromeliads, puyas, uh, which are absolutely stunning plants. They grow very slow, don't need of any irrigation and no needing of any pruning at all. But you have to plant them in very stony soils because they need a free drainage system. And once you build all these different matrix, you start like putting them in the plants. There's no house still. We want to make a very naturalistic garden and we want to make the restoration. So uh, we put them where the conditions for them to grow uh, are perfect. And then we use all the matrix that we've built. We use them in a certain uh, random way. And usually uh, when you finish this work of the matrix, you'll find a lot of gaps. Usually we use another plant to fill the gaps. In this case, we're gonna use Puya Venusta, which is a stress tolerant, slow grow, a key plant in this ecosystem, uh, zero maintenance and a very impressive blooming season. So we're gonna use the Puya Venusta for all the gaps that we um, left, which is very similar of what happened in its original ecosystem, which is very near from this garden. So we're gonna fill every gap with the Puya Venusta and we're gonna use probably some seeds or some other plants in the other gaps to, to fool everything. And then we have our plant community. But 
that that looks just as a patch of plants. But normally, in this uh, in this way of working, which is very strange and unusual, um, we make the design at the very end. So usually, we start by the plant community that we want to build with Magarena, and then when we have everything ready, we're going to make other hardscape. This is a cliff uh, garden. Um, with the slope is huge, so very hard to plant and very hard um, to make everything like walks or or stairs or even the swimming pool because of the slope. So what we're going to make, we're going to put our plant community so uh, in this hardscape, uh, and you'll see the look after because it looks very natural. We're going to make some arrays. We're going to take some adjustment. We're going to take some plants out. For example, the puyas near the the, the place of where you walk, maybe near the, the swimming pool. And what we have at the end is our garden. We have our architecture. We have the heart, heart, heartscape. And everything will look very natural. And what we've learned from plants, using them in an ecological way, is that a lot of the time we're going to build gardens in very difficult conditions. And when, I, when I'm speaking about difficult conditions, usually I'm going to speak about a lot of slope. And with a lot of slope and granite soil or sandy soil, you will have a lot of erosion. So you lose your soil very fast. And what we have in Chile is usually that we have drought, but you can have a rainy year and you can have like 100 millimeters or 70 millimeters in six or eight hours, so a lot of water. And you don't want to lose the soil because that's where you want to, to grow the garden. So what we started to understand with Macarena is that, is that we can use some very special plants, pioneer plants, fast growing. So we use some perennial grass or maybe we can use some eryngium that grows very fast. We plant them before in high density, before the rainy season. But which is interesting of this plant is that they grow fast, but all of them are very shade intolerant. So what we have after a couple of months is that the whole soil is gonna be covered. Some of the time we also use some seeds of annual plants. So the soil is absolutely covered, protected. Um, we're pulling a lot of carbon from the atmosphere, so we're building the microbiology also, and we enhance the capacity of the soil to keep water, but, and we're preserving the soil because there's no erosion. So after a couple of years, what we have is no more um, um, pioneer plants, so we have the plant communities that we thought at the beginning, Look the difference between this garden and look the difference between the neighbor's gardens with just Carpobrotus, which is very usual in Chile just to use Carpobrotus because it's cheap and easy. But when you live in a hotspot, you have to try to make restoration. So uh, what we have is a very diverse, colorful and nice cliff coastal garden with native and exotic plants. We've not lost the soil because we use uh, pioneer plants some of the pioneer plants still grow in very, um, where you have very bad soils, very thin soil, very stony, or with very, very low fertility or a holding water capacity. You will have still some eryngiums and some stipas growing, but most of our native plants are um, working and growing. Uh, these are Altromerias and the Nolana um, Rostrada, which is a wonderful Chilean plants, and also the Chistantes and the Bacaris. Uh, you also have a lot of Bacaris in the United States. Uh, we're going to use also these pioneer plants uh, for the wind. We have some very sensible, sensible areas very near the ocean where most of these uh, pioneer plants will grow and they will break the wind. So this is going to help us to uh, grow some uh, more uh, sensible plants to the wind. Um, we're going to use a lot of altromerias. This is Altromeria pellegrina, uh, which is a very small one, dwarf, very compact, very nice. This is my inspiring muse. I love them. And the most challenge in any uh, coastal garden is absolutely the very first line. So when you have like huge waves, usually this part of the garden has a lot of salt spray, can have, can have also salty water. So you have to be very careful with the plant selection. So we're going to use very specialized plants, communities uh, near this area um, because of the salt spray. 
we're going to use a lot of chistantes and you'll see that still some of our um, pioneer plants like the Orinjum and the Stipas still grow, but most of them, they've been killed by the competition of the, of the other plants. Uh, they don't like the shade. So that's why it's so important to use uh, shade intolerant plants uh, when, when you want to use uh, this technique, okay? Um, this is the same, mostly the same, uh, uh, shrub resistant, a lot of this shrub, or this wind uh, resistant shrubs are very resistant, but not very much when they're small. So we're gonna use these pioneer plants to cover them at the beginning, and then they will grow. And under uh, these baccaries, uh, you'll see, no, this is, uh, I think, Rosmarinus, you'll see the, the dead um, Edinjum and Stipas. And what happened with the garden, not just blooming, restoration, uh, you see a lot of animals that are, that, uh, are back in the garden, a lot of birds, a lot of uh, butterflies. Is some of these uh, insects very, very um, attached to just one kind of plant. So we, we're not just making a nice garden. We also achieve the purpose of reassembling the trophic chains that were lost when the house was built because everything was destroyed. This is one of the last gardens, uh, and this is a slightly strange commission because this is a cemetery. Um, and it's not very useful to make a garden for a cemetery, but which is very nice is that uh, we work with, with very low, low, low fertility soil, and we make the restoration of this coastal cliff. And I love this garden because, because it breaks down the fertility soil myth because we usually have the myth that we have to fertilize a lot to make the plants grow. But we don't, what we don't understand is that in our native Chilean system and in the coastal cliff system, we have a lot of plants very well adapted to very low fertility. So what we use here is crushed stone, is weathered granite stone, which, is, which has zero fertility. Uh, all of the plants that we're gonna use are from a coastal cliff system. We're gonna make a mixture between like 80% of the plants are native from the coastal cliff, but we're gonna use about the 20% of some exotic plants. One of them is from California, the Riogonum Grande, which in, our, in my system after six years hasn't been invasive, but is under observation because this is very important. When I use an exotic plant, uh, I'm always monitoring the garden. I used to monitor, uh, to make garden monitoring for a lot of years, uh, if I think that the plant can be a problem. This is a professional imperative. There you have the Solanum maritimum and the Stipas growing. Uh, Stipas again are very nice as a windbreak, but also it's a very nice plant. You see that the Solanum maritimum, which is a blue, uh, Solanum are growing very well and blooms almost the whole spring. Uh, the low fertility was not a problem. The customer uh, couldn't believe that the garden was so big with no fertilizer and with nothing, with no soil. And that's why plant selection is so crucial. But also you have to keep an eye in drainage. Most of our uh, native plants, uh, especially from semi-arid, arid and Mediterranean our areas are absolutely um, rot, um, can I say rot? But they need very good drainage because they will rot if they don't have the good drainage. And what we do now with Macarena for fertility, we usually use some compost tea or maybe some humus because we want the mi micro microbiology. We don't want the compost. We want what is in, is in the compost, which is uh, life. This is again, the picture of the, uh, this is the end of the Solanum and you, you can see how the nolanas are starting to bloom. So you, you'll see that in this garden, it happens the same that happens in nature, that you have one blooming after the other. So you see how the garden start to change from this lilac to this very uh, light blue color with the, with the nolana. And also you see the Altromedia Maritima and the Eringium, the Altromedia Pellegrina, also the Frankenia, uh, Chilensis, a very nice plant also, this ground cover, which blooms in the spring. 
end of season for the Solanum, but look how gorgeous the Nolanas are. They absolutely crazy blooming by the end of November. And this, this is the very last. And then you have the California plants, the Eriogonum, which blooms the whole summer in my area. So all my native plants go dormant, but I have the Eriogonum making the work because the customers want to have flowers the whole year. And I think it looks very nice, but will the Eriogonum be a well-behaved exotic plant? It has six years and until now it has been, but I still check this cemetery every now and then almost five, six years, six times a year. And I walk all around to see if there's any Eriogonum escaping from the garden because I want to see if it's going to be a problem or not, okay? And this is the last garden, which is the Jardin Mundi. And this was specially done by my, uh, my colleague, Magarena. And we like very much this garden, but when, we, when the architect and the owner of the house asked us for the garden, he wanted the garden in a certain way. Uh, he wanted the house to be just a trade in the landscape. Um, the garden was even more important than the house. And you'll see how the house was built and how the garden like passed through the house. Um, so it looks like a coastal cliff and not like a concrete monster with a garden. And that was uh, very interesting to work with. This is the entrance of the house. As you can see, hills are everywhere here in the central coast of Chile. Uh, so we have to work with slope and you can see how the gardens in a, in a, like pass uh, over the house. So you see that you have a lot of traits of con concrete traits, but a lot of garden covering the house. Uh, we also use in this garden, a lot of uh, plants from two different systems, but that they mix near the ocean, which is the coastal cliff system and the post coastal cliff system. So you're gonna see uh, different, different plant communities. Um, in this garden, we made a mix of terraces and circulations, which were, which were, which were made with uh, granite also, I'll show you. Uh, but the most important was largest par large patches of vegetation because the owner and the architect wanted the house like covered with the garden. Uh, we used the local stone, uh, especially because of the color. Because if you, if you see on the cliff, the color of the, of the cliff, of the cliff is very much like this, this brown color. So uh, we wanted the garden to be very, um, very subtle. Um, not like we wanted the landscape not to be interrupted by the house. So, uh, sorry, here uh, we have all of the plants we use, some native and some exotic plants. This is the end of the spring, beginning of the summer. This is a swimming pool area. This is one of the, of the terrace and this is a swimming pool. Look at uh, the walls uh, with the um, local stone. Uh, this, uh, the soil in this area uh, has this color, like this brown color. Uh, we use a lot of wood also because we have a lot of slope. So we have to try to contain the soil uh, so you'll see uh, wood everywhere, not just in the containing walls, but also in all the circulation. We use treated uh, black painted um, wood, and we use this soil, which is granite also. And this stone, after a lot of years, becomes this soil. So same origin, but one is meteorized and the other one is just a stone. Uh, that was the first garden that we used cactus. A lot of our native cactus are in, on the brink of extinction. So we collect seed, we send them to our nursery, to, our nurse, to the nurseries that provide us plants and they produce the cactus for our works. So we're using two different kinds of cactus. Um, here you can see how the gardens like uh, is all around all the architecture, uh, the swimming pool, the house, etc. And I like very much this picture because this is when the Verbena bonariensis, which is not a native plant, is native from Argentina. It has been described for Chile, but where I live in the central valley, not for the coast. But a lot of our Mediterranean summer um, native plants are going into dormancy. So they start to look yellow or brown. 
And this is still very hard to understand for Chilean people. So we love the spring, we love everything green with a lot of flowers, but when you have the garden starting to turn yellow or um, brown, and it has to be pretty much the same in California, um, well, the people don't like that much. They want to see everything uh, green. And this is why it's so important to understand uh, how plant communities grow and to understand about architecture. Because when you have this garden that starts to get dormant and you know that your customer is not going to be very happy with that, you can use some plants that in a certain way will cover uh, the dormancy. So we can make the mixture between the native plants with summer dormancy and the non-native plants with summer activity. So we have these two kinds of garden living in the same area. So this is what we call a multi-layered uh, garden, a multi-cycle. And this is very interesting, not just because it looks nice, but it's also in a, uh, very interesting in, a, in an ecological, uh, from an ecological point of view, because we have still a lot of food for uh, life, a lot of food for flower flies, bees, and everything. Um, and we also have a lot of carbon for our microbiology. So we're making conservation, restoration, uh, we're making garden at the same time. And this is why this garden is so important for us because we think that we've done this conservation, restoration, and our customer is still happy with, with us, thanks God. So what I have learned from this, this journey, well, I've done a lot of more, more works, but when you work in the coast, we have to understand that there's a lot, lot of a really great uh, real estate development. And this is going to continue because a lot of people want to have a house in the beach. So what can we do as landscapers or gardeners? We have to take the decision to, to not just make design, but we can be very serious and start to make livable, wonderful, beautiful uh, places, but we can make ecology. So we can really contribute to conservation of the richness and diversity of the coastal plant and the animal system. So we have a big responsibility. When I work in coastal uh, system, I had to be very careful with the slope. At the very beginning, I didn't pay very much attention to that, but the runoff of rainwater or the wind erosion is a big problem in my system. And if you understand how the pioneer plants work, you can use the plants to solve the problem while your garden finally is growing. So this is an, uh, an important thing. The soil is absolutely a key condition for our coastal gardens because in until we have two very different situations, the sandy soil and the granitic soil. So the plant communities that you use are gonna be completely different. Some of the plants will thrive in both, but a lot of the plants will thrive just in one. When I use a plant at the very beginning, it was a lot about the eyes. So th this plant is beautiful. I like the color, I like the shape, I like the texture. But when you choose a plant, you have to understand the basic principle that this plant has in this ecosystem of origin. If you understand how the plants work, which is the place that the plant use in its native system, you can use the same principles in your garden to find the correct place to put the plants. I mean, plants are um, have adaptations. They have, um, uh, I don't remember the word, but which is important is I try to understand how the plants work in nature. That's why I travel so much to visit plant communities in, in, wild, wild, in the wild all around the world, because plants are a lot more than just beautiful. We can make lots of things using plants. In our coastal garden, I mean, native plants is not really a key to have success, but I think we must use native vegetation. So I'm using a lot of native plants now, and I think it's a key to success not just in the beauty, but in everything that happened around the garden, which is uh, the ecology of the garden. And when I use exotic plants, what I've learned is that I have to be careful. And I try to use well-behaved exotic, non, uh, well-behaved exotic plants, so non-invasive plants. And what I've found that there's a lot of exotic plants that can be of a great help to sustain permanent population of wildlife. And not just because 
they have pollen or nectar, but maybe they help me covering native plants that are not that nice during the summer dormancy. So I can use the native plants associated with this exotic and these exotic plants will not be, will not be uh, taken out by the customer, but will be preserved in, in place because of this kind of <clears throat> help of the exotic plants. I love color. And I think because I live in a system that is very dynamic in color, I think that the use of color is absolutely a key in the coastal garden because color produce very intense emotion, good and bad for people who live and visit the garden. So I try to use some of the native plants that grow in the area as an inspiration for the color palette. This is very important because in a certain way, when I use this plant, I have a certain, they will mingle with, uh, with the environment. So it's gonna be very pleasant to see and it will connect my garden with the surrounding landscape. Every day I like more low fertility soils. It's amazing because when I started making landscaping, fertilizing compost was a big help to make the garden grow very fast, but gardens growing fast mean a lot of work and gardens with a lot of fertility mean less diversity. So it's very interesting to start to think in low fertility soil because it's a little bit harder to establish sometimes, but uh, if you know the plants, you know the adaptations, you can use this thing to establish very resilient and nice plant communities. And one of the things that I have learned is that the more I advance in time, the more I miss having more time to be alone with nature, to beg nature to reveal her secrets and principles. That is where the landscaper wisdom remains. In silent, in nature, is how I learned to make gardens. And I, I'm missing that. I need more nature because that's where all the information is. This is a picture of my garden. This is not the coast, this is central Chile. Uh, but what can I tell you? Thank you very much. And I feel very honored to talk to the Horticultural Society. Así que, no. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Cristobal. I love that. Thank you so much. Um, and you're going to be joining us in J January as well, I understand. And go ahead and tell us a little bit about what you're going to speak about in January. In January, um, I would like very much to show, you know, Chile has a lot of diversity. I mean, a lot of different climates, uh, different altitudes. So I like to make like a garden tour um, through Chile. So I want to show like the cold jungle system with uh, gardens in the cold jungle system, uh, the Patagonian system, the central area system. And I would like very much to see, uh, to show you some of the work we've done with vineyards, for example, making ecology, uh, biology and gardening, not just making nice garden for the vineyards, but making like biological corridors that looks very nice. We're gonna say, we're gonna make, um, well, I will we'll show you a lot of very interesting gardens. So this is gonna be in some words. Mm, awesome, thanks so much. Does anyone have any um, questions for Cristobal? Cristobal, I... <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Bobby. I'm a landscape architect. I found your talk very stimulating. Thank you very much. I like the way that you um, took the landscape to pieces like a large puzzle and then put it back together. And you've figured out what can work together. Um, I took a lot of notes. I'm going to try some of your ideas. I. I I'm, and this, I'm sorry I haven't had a chance to come visit, but maybe someday. No, you're, you're absolutely welcome. And you know that the, the matrix system absolutely works. When we started working with the matrix system with Magarena, uh, she was very nervous at the beginning because it, it, it sounds very strange to make this kind of puzzle. But yes, when you see the, the plan, you see a puzzle. But when you see the garden, you, you don't realize that there's a puzzle and it looks very natural. It's, it's very amazing. 
especially when we think in a multi-layered system. So thank you very much for your comments. You need to write your book. <laughs> With a better English, I hope. Your English was wonderful. You did beautifully. <laughs> really very wonderful. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions or comments or anything of that nature? I had a question, Ellen. Um, this is hi, Carol. Carol. Hi, Cristobal. I loved your hi. talk. It's nice to see these gardens. Some of them, I think, maybe a second time. I'm wondering if you have worked with any public agencies on um, implementing this type of, of garden in public yes. spaces. We're working. That's one of the things that I will show you in the next presentation. But yes, we're, we're working in what we call in Chile comunas. Uh, I don't know how to translate that in county. Maybe it, it's, I think it's an English word, but for, but yes, we, we're making that. Uh, it's a little bit different when you work for public areas because, because you have to take, for example, maintenance is a big issue. So um, when we work in public areas, we made a completely different plant communities. We use a lot of fire adapted plants because uh, you know that in public areas, <clears throat> maintenance is gonna be very bad. So we need plants very well adapted to regrow after this, uh, the pruning, for example, the pruning. Uh, but we're, we've done a lot of work and we're making a lot more. And what we're doing this year, which is amazing, oh. is that some of these um, comunas uh, understood that uh, we cannot be watering grass uh, lawns. So, there's a lot of uh, useless lawns almost everywhere. We're taking that out and we're making low watering and low maintenance plant communities, but with a very high ecological uh, value. So uh, what we want to me is make kind of a, a urban national park. Do you understand the, what yes. I mean? Yes. So yes. we want to take out the lawns, the lawns like grasses, which are not very useful, lawn, I, I mean, Cesped, and we're going to replace the lawn with a lot of very interesting plant communities and with both native and exotic plants. And that makes a big difference we, because we have a lot of people in Chile talking just about native, but we need the exotic plants in our system at least because we have very few native summer uh, growing plants. You know, so if you use just native during the summer, you will have not flowers and people, they want the, the, the changes of color, they want flowers. So that's what we're making. And I'll show some of that in the next presentation. Thank you. Anybody else? I wanted to congratulate Cristobal, but very good presentation. And her, his concepts are very important now because Chile is under uh, many years of drought. So all these concepts he's playing are very important for us. So I am very happy to hear all his comments and explanations. Thank you, Bristol. Por favor. <laughs> yes, and I, I would second a lot of that. Hi, Cristobal. How you doing? Uh, I was also on that tour. Um, the one thing, um, Again, I, I very much enjoyed this talk and got a lot of interesting ideas out of it. Uh, where you were talking about the spring natives and the summer exotics, um, I'm sure there've got to be equivalents as there are in California. I mean, California has a very interesting and very little used um, summer flowering flora. Uh, mostly because people just aren't that interested in them because most of them are daisies. Although as, as one of the plants you're using, the Areogonum, and that one is Areogonum grande variety rubescens, by the way. Yes. Uh, there are a number of other types of Areogonum grande uh, that you also might find interesting. But um, it's... It's, I'm surprised to hear that there aren't more um, summer, just less familiar or less uh, exciting flowering plants. Um, I mean, very much like here, most people want Zauschnerias or um, some of our late buckwheats, 
And again, we have myriad uh, daisies, uh, but most people don't get them. You know, I think that California, I mean, you, uh, you have more diversity than we do have. And you know that a lot of our summer, uh, our warm season growing Mediterranean plants are um, high mountain plants. Mm. And they're, um, because they grow in the mountains, usually they're very small because they have to, li they live in a very, um, imagine the, the Andes, I mean, mm. when I work, you can find plants about three hundred three. 3,000 meters, I'm talking of these kind of plants that will um, bloom during the summer. They're very small, very compact. So, I mean, they're nice, but not that, that interesting to be used in a garden. Maybe you can use them because you're a collectionist. So for example, I have some very high altitude altromedias, which are amazing, mm -hmm. but this is not like, I, I wanna talk, this is not like a showy plant so we have some lobelias and some mirabilis, native ones that do uh, bloom in the summer, but really our system is a winter and a spring system, which is amazing in the winter uh, and the spring when there's a rainy year. But if we want to use more uh, warm, uh, warm season plants, uh, you have to go south to the south of Chile and this is more a temperate system. So most of these plants will bloom in the summer, but they need a lot of water. Hmm. But the uh, eriogonums are wonderful. I love them. But I'm a little bit nervous if, the, if they can be invasive in my system. So I've used them not very much, just in this cemetery, and I've used them in my house. And it seems that they have not escaped from the garden, but I think I, I still have to, to wait maybe four or five more years to start using them more. I don't know how, how where, they, where they grow, which are the, like the wild conditions in California, but um, probably they're very similar to our conditions. So uh, yes. nice plants, but I'm still a little bit aware of, of using it uh, more. It's uh, Ariam grande rubescens is from uh, uh, Santa Rosa Island and uh, Santa Cruz Island off of the coast of uh, Southern California. And they are coastal bluff type plants pr principally, although they can grow into coastal uh, grasslands and other areas. Um, but yeah, and here in some gardens, they do seed around but they're never really pests and I've never seen them escape out into the landscape, even when they're planted near the coast. Carol might have uh, some places where she, she's more familiar with a lot more Southern coastal gardens than I am. Uh, but the one I, I would say is excellent, but it does escape is Areognum giganteum and to a lesser extent, Areognum arborescens, uh, which are also island buckwheats here. Um, but grande rubescens and grande grande don't seem to be. Carol, would you add something they're very, to that? And you know, Bob, they're very hardy. I mean, because I grow in my house and this year I got like minus seven and nothing happened to the Areognum. So they're very uh, frost hardy. I yeah. Surprised. Well, I mean, and that's one of the things that limits some of our growing of Chilean plants is that uh, California's Mediterranean system is the longest dry season, and it also is the coldest winters. So it doesn't surprise me that you're successful with them, uh, but it does explain why we don't grow more Chilean Mediterranean plants. Uh, except for along the coast, where we do enjoy the, the Puyas and the Alstromerias, among others. But we really don't have hardly any nol Nolanas, which, uh, again, you showed some spectacular Nolanas. Nolanas are, it's an incredible family. Not easy to grow because very low watering and absolutely free draining soil. They hate water. 
that's usually this is why most of our native plants are not very popular because we water them too much so we kill them you know so that's why we don't use them because you see the nolanas in the wild or or in my gardens and people got crazy and they want to plant nolanas but they use soil and not stone i and they water the nolanas too much so they die but nolanas are amazing and they can be very long lived plants so oh. some of my Nolan, Nolanas, they have, I mean, you have some manuals like Nolana Rostrata, for example, no, Nolana Paradoxa, but mm -hmm. the, the, the Nolana Rostrata uh, or Cholestis are, I mean, they have 12, 15 years, and huge plants, amazing plants, not easy to, not easy to re reproduce them, but they grow and they live, they have their long lived perennials. Very nice. And cold resistance, some of them. Hmm. That one that you showed at the cemetery that was brilliant blue, which one was that? This is Nolana Rostrata. Good. I made a note. I will try that one. I can send you seed if you want. Perfect. I'm going to California by the end of August. So I ah. can give you to, I don't know, to, to someone. But they need Nolana Rostrata usually. It's... Um, it's very hard to germinate, uh, needs um, hot. So it's not fire, but because we're not a fire adapted system, we're a little bit different from the other Mediterraneans. I mean, we're a fire adapted system, but we don't need fire for propagation in our, in our system. It's different from the California or the Australian or South African system, but hot weather is great to grow. After a hot summer, it's easier to make the Nolana grow or to use some hot water. Oh, okay, great. When you come up, you'll have to do, we'll have to do some field trips, hint, hint, hint. <laughs> yeah, I'll, ask you, I'll, I'll ask you some advices to, to see what we visit. Again, a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Just thank you, you all. <laughs> Thank you, okay.